How's it going? Welcome to the channel. My name is Waldo, and in this video, I'm going to try to finish up this here flatbed. I'm going to dramatically change the look of the rear end by building a nice rear bumper. I'm going to try to save some money by building my own toolboxes, and I am going to make an improvement to this that DOT is probably not going to like. I should mention this is part two of the build series, so if you haven't seen part one yet, a link to that is going to be down in the description. So I have decided that the first thing I want to work on is the toolboxes, and I'm going to go ahead and try to cut out this rectangle right here to make a toolbox. Now the challenge is to cut this out while preserving this piece right here, because I'd like to reuse this to make the door of the toolbox. I'm going to try to use my jigsaw, and in order to do that, I need to drill a hole here so that I can start the blade somewhere. I just finished up a spool of wire and so I had to throw a new one in here and that reminded me one of the things I really like about this machine and that is it can take really large spools of wire. I think it can take up to 12 inch spools. If you're welding mild steel I believe that's a 33 pound spool which is really nice because buying the larger spools can save you a fair amount of money if you do a lot of welding. The other thing is that when it comes to dual shield flux core wire a lot of those only come in the larger spool sizes so you can use those with this machine machine. Most machines of this size can't take those big spools of wire and so it's a really cool feature on this machine. All right, leave your jokes in the comments, but the reason why this welder makes such a distinctive noise is because I'm welding in pulse mode, which helps with things like welding thin material and also welding out of position. Before I install this toolbox, I want to drill some holes for this piano hinge because it's a lot easier to do with this outside of the vehicle than once it's installed. So this hinge is stainless, and I also got some nice stainless hardware as well. Cool. pretty well. I might need about three or four hands to do this though. All right, we're on. Yeah, so these lip edges that I installed are going to be to hold on this weather stripping material. This is actually from my last flatbed build that's left over, and it's going to work great for this. But...
not too bad. Nice. <laughs> Too bad, that whole thing in one pass. So I got this thing installed and then over here in the corners I had to add a little bit of material just because the corners of the weather stripping here I had to round the edges in order to make it fit and this is just so that it seals up against the weather stripping and doesn't let any water in. I also made this little latch out of steel just for durability and that is going to bolt to the top of the toolbox about like that and that will catch this little latch here. Now hopefully this thing closes. Does. Okay, well, that's not too bad. Yeah, so I went ahead and got the toolbox down on the driver's side. One of the differences here is that I had to make room for the fuel filler coming up. So if you look on the inside, it takes a little bit of space out of the toolbox, but really not that much at all. So it's not too bad. So I realized that up until this point in the video that I was actually welding with contaminated argon gas. I was wondering why it was welding kind of crappy and the welds were sootier than they should be. And then I swapped a new bottle of argon in here and it solved everything and the welds are beautiful now. Mwah. I guess that's just a little bit of a lesson there if your welds are looking kind of crappy and like maybe you're not getting enough shielding gas coverage but you know you are getting good enough shielding gas coverage and you can't figure out what the problem is, try a new bottle of argon because in rare circumstances they can come contaminated from your gas supplier. All right, so the next task at hand is to do the trim on the sides here and also the rear bumper. I just bought this nice sheet of 3 16 inch thick aluminum to make the rear bumper. I was gonna use quarter inch plate instead, it's for strength really, but Peter Zila recommended that I go with 3 16 instead, so he's the expert when it comes to aluminum fabrication, so I'm just gonna go with what he says. I'm also going to use this to make a custom front bumper for the truck. However, that is going to be for a different video. So obviously I still have to fully weld this thing, but cosmetically the bumper is all here now. 
I also have to get in behind this and reinforce it because, I mean, I don't know if you can see that flex from over there, but this is definitely not going to be strong enough as it is. I wouldn't even want to use this as a step right now to get up onto the bed without reinforcing it. So once I remove the bed from the truck so that I can get underneath a bit easier, I'll go ahead and weld in some reinforcements. All right, I think the last thing that I have to do before I can remove this bed from the truck to get easier access underneath it is I have to do the fuel filler over here. Now this bed is gonna have a gusset in between the bed itself and the headache rack to strengthen this connection and the fuel filler is gonna be integrated into that. I need to join two pieces of 3 8 inch thick aluminum and so I've ground a 45 degree bevel into each piece at the butt joint. Technically this material is thicker than what the welding machine is rated for, but with some preheating and a little bit of gun manipulation, I think I can get away with it. There was a little bit of contamination in the joint right there, but it was only in one spot, so I continued welding. You may have noticed the lack of a pulse sound while welding this joint. That's because I have the welder set to the normal synergic mode for maximum power output. As I approach the end of the joint, I use the remote control to taper off the power to avoid blowing out the weld due to heat buildup. You can see this is the spot where that contamination was, but otherwise this didn't turn out too bad. I'll be able to grind this down and then I can bevel the other side and weld that as well. Look how that turned out. These are going to be used to hold some nice stainless D-rings in the corners of the flatbed. That's not going anywhere. I managed to get all four corners welded on and I trimmed the deck planks to fit. I also cut a hole in the deck to access the gooseneck hitch. <laughs>
There we go, now I have excellent access to everything under there to finish this thing up. Well, I got this thing up on the lift and I've been working on little odds and ends here and there, but right now it is time to fully weld the back end of this thing. I've gone in here and done a little bit of back gouging, so let's get to work. So now that I have the vast majority of the welding done on this flatbed, my main focus is going to turn to the electrical wiring portion of it. My regular viewers know that I generally like to do things the right way, and with my background in computer engineering, wiring is certainly no exception. All of the connections are going to be soldered with a soldering iron. I have heat shrink tubing here to help seal out the elements and prevent corrosion. And then all of the wiring is going to be going inside of split loom for additional protection. I am going to need a way to secure my wiring harness to the frame of the flatbed and for that I decided to recycle some of this leftover floor planking material here. I cut it up into small pieces like this, drilled little holes in each one of them so that I can fit a zip tie around this. When welded to this, that's going to make a really nice attachment point. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I did switch to 5000 series wire because I ran out of 4000 series, so that's why it sounds a bit different. One of the things that I like about this truck is that it has a three wire tail lamp system, and that means that it has a wire for the tail lights themselves, it has a wire for the brake lamps, and then it has a third and separate wire for the turn signals. That enables you to have a separate amber turn signal, which is nice because it's less ambiguous and therefore safer than having a combined red stop lamp turn signal. As for the headache rack on this, the way I designed it, it requires a two wire system. That is a combined turn signal and stop lamp because I like the way that looks with only a single red light up there. And of course I could have fit an amber turn signal up there if I wanted to, but I think that would crowd it. So that is what I went with. This design requires me to convert the three wire signal to a two wire signal. And so I bought a converter to do just that and I will be wiring that in. Once this thing is all wired up and installed on the truck, it will be interesting to see how it looks having an amber turn signal down there and a red turn signal up here that's also combined with the stoplights. Hopefully it doesn't look stupid. Up here on the headache rack, I wanna snake these wires through the tubing here so that they're not exposed. As for toolbox lighting, I'm gonna use these little LED light strips with adhesive backing so that I could just stick them to the top of the toolbox and they should hopefully provide enough light. After I pulled the wires for the lights through the hole in the top of the toolbox, I applied some silicone caulk to prevent water from getting in. Well, I got everything covered up in split loom nicely. The toolbox lights are all wired in. And I have several grounding points like this one. They're all smothered in dielectric grease to help resist corrosion. I think at this point there's nothing stopping me from reinstalling the deck so that I can weld it in place permanently at last. The easiest way for a YouTuber to do that is to use the snap trick. So why won't it work? Ah, there we go. Honestly, I don't know how non-YouTubers get anything done. 
A viewer asked in part one how I'm going to secure the ends of the deck planks, and well, here's the answer. Essentially, I'm going to do a fillet weld in between this piece of the frame and the bottom ribs of the planks themselves. What makes this tricky is that the piece of frame here is a quarter inch thick piece of aluminum, and these ribs are really small, thin pieces of aluminum. This frame member here requires a lot of heat input in order to get full penetration, but then these little ribs here will blow through really easily if I use that much heat there. I'm going to start out by preheating this lower frame member, and that means I won't have to use quite as much heat while I'm welding. I'm going to start welding about three quarters of an inch to an inch below the joint at full power, and then I'm going to work my way up slowly, and by the time I get to the joint itself, I should be getting full penetration on this big piece of metal, but then when I get to the joint, I'm going to use my thumb on the remote control to pull back the power a lot so that I can tie these two pieces in without blowing through on the rib of the deck. <laughs> There we go. That's the one I just welded and it came out perfectly. All right, I need to do something about this center high mount stoplight. You see, the old fashioned incandescent bulbs in this light look really bad next to the LED lights on the headache rack. So DOT be darned, I'm gonna disable them. I'm gonna go over this lightly with some 120 grit sandpaper, although the surface is already rough enough just from weathering that this may not actually be necessary. With a little bit of primer and paint, this light should hopefully look more like a filler panel than an actual light. This thing's still a little bit tacky, so I'm trying to be careful not to touch it, and I think I succeeded. Sweet, well that looks pretty good. And with the flatbed back on the truck, you barely even notice it there. Well, here's the finished result. What do you guys think? Now I have the lights on and it is midday, so I don't know if you can really see them on the camera, but they look fantastic. These little marker lights in particular, they just really pop. And now if I get inside the vehicle, I can show you. So that's what the brake lights look like. I would imagine you can see those. There's the left turn signal. The colors probably look a little bit washed out because the lights are so bright, but from here, it looks pretty good to me. Now, what's really interesting is that when the turn signal is on and I put my foot on the brake, you can see that the lights actually alternate. That's kind of interesting because that tells me how the converter is implemented and it's really just a simple exclusive OR gate inside. Oh, and of course I have the white lights on the back there all wired up, looking pretty good. I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see the light from the toolboxes, but it does actually work quite well. I did try it out last night and it produces plenty of light and it's really nice and even as well. Oh, I also added some wheel spacers to the rear wheels here. I think they're about an inch and a half and it looks really good. It gets the tire out pretty close to the edge of the flatbed, but I think it's not so far that if for whatever reason I have a huge load on here and the bed sags down, I don't think that the tires are going to rub. Now, I'm sure you guys wanna know what it costs to build one of these, and so I put together a little spreadsheet of all the costs. The deck planks themselves cost me $878. All the other aluminum stock cost $2,364. Uh, the other miscellaneous stuff like lights and wiring and hardware cost an additional $367 and that brings us to a total of $3,609. Now if we figure we spend a few hundred dollars on welding supplies that brings the total cost to build this flatbed pretty close to $4,000. Now what could you buy one of these for new? It's hard to say for sure since manufacturers don't publish their prices and also 
even with professionally made flatbeds, it's hard to find one that looks this good, but I think you'd be spending at least $7,000, but probably more. So the next question is, should you build one of these? Well, I think that for the most part, there are two types of people who are gonna build a flatbed like this. Number one, YouTubers, and number two, people who enjoy building things and have the time to do it. If you're a busy small business owner, for example, and you're thinking about building one of these for your business, my suggestion is you probably should just go ahead and buy one unless you really need something that's special and custom or if you have some other incentives. I'm not really factoring in the cost of my time to build one of these because, well, first of all, I don't actually track my time, but I do assure you it took a lot of effort to build this. Up next, I'm gonna be working on part two of my cheap Range Rover video series. The video for part one has been doing really well on YouTube, so if you haven't seen that, I recommend giving it a watch. Thank you so much for watching, and if you're in the US, have a happy Memorial Day.